Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Lackawanna Pastimes. I'm Sarah Puccini, the Assistant Director of the Lackawanna Historical Society. Um, I will be doing the program this month rather than turning it over to somebody else. Um, January marks Anthracite Heritage Month. The end of January of 1959 was the Knox Mine Disaster, sort of the nail in the coffin of deep mining in the Anthracite region. Uh, anthracite Heritage Month is a way to celebrate the history and heritage of the Anthracite Coal region. Uh, there are a number of programs going on throughout the month. Uh, this is one of those one of those programs. Uh, this is based on research that I did when I was in college, looking at the Molly Maguires and Terrence Powderly as different ways to approach the idea of unionism and ways to achieve uh, achieve your ends as working in the working in the coal fields. The program today is the Vigilante and the Grandmaster, uh, focusing on the Molly Maguires and Terrence Powderly. Uh, from the mid 19th century through the early 20th century, coal was king in northeastern Pennsylvania. By the 1870s, railroads owned most coal mines and were their own best customer. They also controlled the price of coal and miners' wages. This dominant relationship contributed to the already existing tensions in the coal regions. Miners worked long hours in dark, dangerous mines for little pay and were forced to pay high rents for company-owned housing and high prices in the company-owned store. Ethnic strife between immigrant groups living in close proximity and competing for jobs contributed to the tension as well. The coal fields often erupted into violence, strikes, and lockouts as the miners began to create organizations to work with the mine owners. Two solutions emerged, the vigilante and the union man. In the southern coal fields, Molly Maguires abandoned the union in favor of vigilante violence, while in Scranton, Terrence Powderly opposed violence in his rise to union membership. Labor problems existed across the coal region, but the region itself was not created equal and can't be examined as a whole. The coal region, north, northeastern Pennsylvania, is divided into two major sections, each with smaller subsections. The upper part of the coal region is divided into the northern coal fields in Upper Luzerne and what is now Lackawanna County, and the smaller eastern middle field in southern Luzerne County. Scranton and Hazleton served as the primary economic centers in this region. The lower, coal, lower anthracite region is divided into the western middle field, crossing Northumberland and Columbia counties and part of Schuylkill County, and the southern fields, which is the largest of the four, extended from Schuylkill County through Lebanon, Dauphin, and Carbon counties. Uh, due to a quirk of geology, the coal in the northern fields was found in slightly pitched, nearly horizontal seams and could easily be extracted, while in the south, the coal was in almost vertical seams, nearly impossible to extract. Erosion had exposed the tops of some seams, making it easy for small, um, making it, oops, Sorry, friends. There you go. Uh, making it easier uh, to expose to expose some of the, the coal and, and get it out. It was easier for small operators to, to do this. Um, the southern field was the largest, but also the deepest field. And once the easy coal was gone, the region didn't have the resources to sink deep shafts. Miners in the north were controlled by large corporations, mainly railroads, and they enjoyed higher discipline and higher wages than those in the south where independent operators and small collieries did not have the manpower or the capital to operate the huge underground operations that were standard in the northern fields. This made mining in the south more turbulent, as mines paid lower wages and shut down once the easily accessible coal had been mined. The northern mines shipped more than half of the total anthracite output of the region, but the larger southern fields held the potential to surpass the northern fields if developed properly. The president of the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, Franklin Gowan, stepped to the plate in the 1870s in an attempt to organize the southern region. In the north, five anthracite coal hauling railroads ran through the region, but the southern anthracite fields was served only by the Philadelphia and Reading. Gowan planned to consolidate the small operators by the, un, under the Reading and change the railroad's charter to allow him to purchase coal lands. He assumed control of the Reading during a strike led by a fledgling miners union, the Workingmen's Benevolent Association, um, that shut down the school kill mines. The dispute was caused by how the market changes should affect the miners' wages, the adoption of the sliding scale. Uh, as the anthracite coal strike entered its third month, Gowan offered his services at a me as a mediator. The resulting Gowan compromise, agreed to by both the operators and the WBA, set the base price at $2 per ton, which was lower than the union had proposed, but increased wages eight and a quarter percent for every 25 cent increase of the price of coal, which was a higher percentage the operators were offering. Gowan's system required the sliding scale to work both ways. A wages would decrease if the price of coal fell, which it did immediately after the Southern mines reopened and flooded the markets. When decreasing wages led to another strike in 1871, Gowan used the opportunity to further consolidate small operators and the union under the Reading. 
he raised freight prices so high it was nearly impossible to move coal out of the region, only relenting when the operators and union men agreed to return to work at wages he had deemed suitable. The resulting firestorm over Gowan's dictatorial control led to the formation of a committee in the Pennsylvania Senate to examine the right of the railroad companies to set coal freights. The committee took a narrow view, noting that because the right to set rules and regulations regarding merchandise was clearly outlined in the Reading Charter, they agreed that Gowan's action were legal and simply ignored the egregious abuse of power. Uh, the hearings, however, set the stage for Gowan's prolonged battle with organized labor. During his testimony, he introduced the idea of a sinister, violent movement behind the WBA that he claimed, quote, votes in secret at night that men's lives shall be taken, that they shall be shot before their wives, murdered in cold blood for daring to work against the order, and that only men who are shot are they who disobey the mandates of the Workingmen's Benevolent Association. Gowan's reference is one of the first public mentions of the Molly Maguires. The infamous Molly Maguires were a secret Irish labor organization active in the Southern coal fields from the Civil War until about 1880. Historically, the Mollies have been seen as an outgr outgrowth of the Irish tendency toward violence, a terrorist organization brought to justice through the heroic efforts of James McParlin, a Pinkerton detective who infiltrated their ranks. The group was believed to be an offshoot of the White Boys, or Ribbon Men, agrarian groups active in Ireland since the early 19th century. Their fight against the agents of oppressive English landlords was often violent and involved revenge killings. Historian Kevin Kenny stresses that the violence was most often against the Irish agents, middlemen, and tenants, rather than the English landowners themselves, and was more often an attempt to maintain the traditional Irish way of life in the face of modern intrusions and improvements. The Mollies were acting as community defenders. Even the name Molly Maguires conjures images of the traditional Irish families. 18th century Irish poets used a beautiful woman named Molly Maguire to symbolize Ireland a symbol that was embraced by activists disguised in women's clothing, calling themselves the children of Molly Maguire. They represented the mothers of a nation of, a nation of Ireland begging for bread for their children. Molly Maguire violence was not haphazard. It was carried out with a specific aim to defend the way of life that they had always known. The violence that erupted in the coal region cannot simply be explained by, na by national or re religious differences carried over from the old country. The battle had immediate economic re repercussions as well. Early British, Welsh, and German immigrants to the coal region had experienced mining coal in their home countries and were hired as miners, firemen, and foremen, while new Irish immigrants with no knowledge of mining were hired as common laborers. The miners drilled and blasted the coal, then left for the day, while the laborers remained behind, often six or seven more hours loading coal. They did the backbreaking labor for longer hours, yet received lower wages than miners. The apprenticeship system in Schoolkill region mines allowed English, Welsh, German, and American miners to move up into skilled positions, but Irish miners were not eligible for such promotions. The fact that class divisions corresponded with already existing ethnic divisions added fuel to the fire. The violence began as a series of draft riots in Schoolkill County, as Irish laborers resisted the idea of fighting for a war for what was still to them a foreign country. Mine bosses were beaten, and the first two of 16 assassinations were carried out during the war. Conspiracy theories grew. Anthracite coal was a crucial part of the Union's war effort, and the labor uprisings were viewed as subversive activities against the state. During this time, the Mollies were a law unto themselves, and could laugh at the real law and its authorized preservers about as heartily as ever any organized gang of lawbreakers. None stood trial, and with the end of the war and the rise of the United Trade Unions, the Workingmen's Benevolent Association, the violence subsided. The WBA, which was founded in 1869 in Schoolkill County, was dominated by Irishman John Siney, who struck an uneasy balance between trying to meet the needs of the skilled British and Welsh miners by preserving their craft status, but also trying to meet the goals of the laboring classes for higher wages and the possibility of promotion. Most importantly, the union leaders declared that the direct, sporadic, and violent strategy of labor activism embodied by the Molly Maguires was the antithesis of the union's policy. Molly Maguire activity would only da damage the reputation and strength of the union. The union explicitly denounced violence, believing it was more profitable to sit and talk with the mine owners and representatives rather than attacking them. Siney pointed out that by the rules of the association, all acts of violence are strictly prohibited and that the WBA kept strict adherence to social law and order. 
A major accomplishment of the WBA was their push for mine safety regulations after the 1869 Avondale mine disaster. The resulting Mine Safety Act, signed in 1870, required two outlets for each mine, rather than a single entrance as at Avondale. The law strengthened the union by demonstrating the power of collective action, but also placed more control of the mines in the hands of mine owners by making the mines more disciplined, regulated work environments. The loss of control was crucial as Franklin Gowan took control of the Reading Railroad and began his push to gain control over the anthracite production in the entire southern field. Gowan clashed with the WBA during wage negotiations to determine the sliding scale and used every opportunity to more firmly tie the union to the radical Mollies in the public mind. In early 1873, rumors circulated that the Molly Maguires were active again. Mine owners and superintendents began receiving coffin notices, threatening violence if the recipient did not leave town, and a series of suspicious fires started at collieries. Gowan went to Alan Pinkerton, America's foremost detective, for help eradicating the Molly Maguires. At a meeting in Philadelphia, Gowan told, the Pinkerton that, Gowan told Pinkerton that the Mollies were, quote, a noxious weed of foreign birth that was spreading across the region and that, quote, wherever anthracite is employed, it has also felt the vice-like grip of this midnight dark lantern murderous-minded fraternity. Um, whatever you think of Franklin Gowan, he had a way with words. Um, I do love the way he describes all of these things. Um, but the WBA was Gowan's main target, uh, but the victory would be meaningless unless the Mollies were eliminated as well. In his mind, the two were linked to a single entity. Gowan considered it was his sacred mission to bring the Mollies to justice and asked Pinkerton to send an undercover detective to infiltrate the group. Pinkerton sent James McCarlin, who was an Ulster native, um, and used the alias James McKenna in his dealings with the Mollies. McParlin's first step was to become a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, an Irish Catholic fraternal organization believed to be a front for the Mollies. The AOH was condemned by the Catholic Church because members were required to swear a secret oath to a secular authority outside the scope of the church. The AOH and the Mollies were denounced from coal region pulpits. Suspected Mollies were excommunicated from the Catholic Church for their actions. But Parliament was initi initiated into the AOH and gained the confidence of leading Mollies, making daily reports to the Pinkerton offices in Philadelphia. Gowan was impatient for something to happen, so he asked all operators to announce a, a, wage, a, cut, yeah, announce a wage cut effective in December of 1874. His actions forced what will be known as the Long Strike, lasting until June of 1875. The strike was a disaster for the Union and started a wave of retaliatory violence against mine owners. The Mellon of Wires were back in action. The end of the Long Strike also signaled the end of the WBA. The union members lost faith in their leaders and moved away from the WBA in the wake of the strike. The Mollies emerged as the only organizational body left and they resumed their direct violent action. Coffin notices leading to kill orders went out against mine owners, superintendents, and foremen. Within the year, Gomer James, Benjamin Yost, Thomas Gwinther, Thomas Sanger, William Uren, and John P. Jones had been assassinated by suspected Mollies. McParlin remained an important part of the Mollies planning. He had knowledge of the killings of Sanger, Uren, and Jones, and failed to warn them in time. Recently, debate has arisen whether he was acting as an agent provocateur and allowing the killings to continue so he could gather more evidence against the Molly Maguires. McParlin claimed suspicion was gathering, and he could simply not warn the men without blowing his cover. Based on information submitted by James McParlin, a Pickerton report was issued in the fall of 1875 that listed the names and addresses of 13 suspected murderers, along with their rank in the AOH. McParlin left the coal region not long after, when a staged raid on a boarding house owned by suspected Mollies James and Charles O'Donnell in the Wiggins Patch neighborhood of Mahanoy City led to the death of James' pregnant wife, Ellen. Uh, the Pinkertons were beginning to cross the line between protection and antagonism, but McParlin's presence was really no longer mattered. Um, the first trials of Molly Maguire's began one month later in January of 1876. Since Galvin hired Pinkertons and was involved in every step of the investigation, he considered it only natural he should also be involved in the trial. Galvin had himself appointed, appointed as a special prosecutor. Most of the prosecuting attorneys worked for railroads or mining companies, and Irish Catholics were excluded from the, from the juries. Uh, historian Kevin Kenny notes, the Molly Maguire investigation and trials marked one of the most astounding surrenders of sovereignty in American history. A private corporation initiated the investigation through a private detective agency 
a private police force, the Coal and Iron Police, arrested the supposed offenders, and the coal company attorneys prosecuted. The state provided only the courtroom, the hangman, and the rope. Uh, Mc McParland served as the star witness in the trials, exposing his cover identity to identify to testify against each defendant. The accused could hardly believe that the quiet, gentlemanly, cool, resolute witness, James McParland, was the wild and reckless, ever boasting James McKenna that they had known. The evidence of the trial was almost solely the testimony of McParland and an accused Molly McGuire named Kelly the Bum, uh, who turned state's evidence in, excuse, in, in exchange for immunity. The prosecution relied on circular arguments based on an ethnic stereotype. The Irish committed crimes because they were savage, and proof of their proof of their savagery was the crimes they committed. Uh, with the deck stacked against them, the Mollies were convicted in short order. In February, Michael Doyle and Edward Kelly were sentenced to death for the murder of John P. Jones. In June, Alexander Campbell was accused of being an accessory to Jones' murder and sentenced to death as well. On July 22nd, James Carroll, James Rorty, Hugh McGeehan, and James Boyle were sentenced, sentenced to death for the murder of Benjamin Yost. The show trials continued, often with the same men accused of multiple crimes. John Kehoe was sentenced to seven years in prison, the maximum possible term, for the murder of William Bully Bill Thomas, then three days later tries and sentenced to another seven years in prison for a conspiracy to kill William and Jesse Major. Thomas Duffy, the final defendant accused of the murder of Benjamin Yost, was sentenced to death in September of 1876. Alexander Campbell, already on death row for his role in the Jones murders, was sentenced to death again, along with John Yellow, Jack Donahue, and Thomas Fisher for the murder of Morgan Powell. In February of 1877, the final three Molly Maguires, Patrick Hester, Peter McHugh, and Patrick Tully, were sentenced to death for the murder of Alexander Ray. Gowan has succeeded in his battle against the Molly Maguires. He defended his actions as a public service. He said, I took pains to show that there was a great secret association banded together for the purpose of committing outrages, which have given a notorious character not only to the laboring people of the country, but to the whole country itself. The executions themselves were public spectacles. Uh, Campbell, Doyle, Donahue, and Kelly were scheduled to be executed in Mock Chunk, uh, Jan June 21st of 1877. O'Boyle, Carroll, Duffy, McGeehan, Munley, and Rorty will be executed on, in Pottsville on the same day. Um, authorities in Mock Chunk built a deluxe gallows with two crossbars, so all four, four mollies could be hung at once, uh, but not to be outdone. Pottsville constructed a three crossbar gallows, um, but decided in the last moment to hang the men in pairs. Tickets were sold for the executions, and huge crowds gathered outside both prisons. Um, the Catholic Church brought priests in to administer the last rites and perform their sober duty, uh, but the church itself emerged vindicated in their criticism of the Mali's actions. They said, had the men followed edicts of the church, they wouldn't have found themselves about to be executed anyway. Um, by noon, the executed executions were complete in Mok Chunk. By 1.30, all six men had been executed in Pottsville. The Black Thursday executions were a widely popular event. An article in the Scranton Republican called it a grand day and noted that, quote, a great evil has been removed from the country. Even the New York Times correspondents report on the excitement in the two towns and give detailed descriptions of the deaths of the Mollies. The Day of the Rope was the largest mass execution of convicted Molly Maguires, and over the next two years, 10 more Mollies, including, including Jack Kehoe, were executed in Bloomsburg, Mock Chunk, Pottsville, and Sunbury. After their deaths, the respectable people living in Schoolkill region felt that the law had been vindicated, and that their corner of the world was once again safe from marauding bands of Irish rebels. The New York Times surmised that Mollyism was much deeper seated than has been supposed. Their popularity grew in the Irish community, and funerals of the, of the, of the executed were largely attended, and the respectable portion of the Irish made an ostentatious display of sympathy. Uh, still, the Molly Maguires were painted with a harsh brush as a symbol of Irish depravity. Although they examined the same problems of social mobility, workforce advancement, fair wages, and working conditions, then the relationship between labor and capital, as were examined by the WBA and other unions, their direct, usually violent methods differed sharply from the methods of the union they're often associated with, and their violence was aimed at solving problems on a local level, rather than creating a regional solution. By the time the last of the Mollies had been executed, the violent labor movement had run its course. Uh, benevolent union activism was on the rise, and politics, not pistols, soon came to ruin the ru rule the day. Uh, most arguments against the Molly Maguires were rooted in the assumption that all Irish were inherently violent, able to negotiate only with their fists. 
It's ironic, then, that the leader of one of the most powerful labor unions of the late 19th century was the son of Irish immigrants, Terence Powderly. Powderly was not an educated man applying a learned theory to a situation, but rather a worker applying personal experience. He was, quote, the child of industrial capitalism, blast furnaces, smokestacks, slag heaps, and towering coal tipples comprised the only environment he had ever known. Grime and coal dust coated much of his world, and the incessant sounds of factory whistles, railroad engines, and mine cars were inescapable. Most fortunate, more fortunate than most, Powderly was nevertheless a wage worker who shared with his neighbors the danger, exploitation, deprivation, and insecurity that were part and parcel of the industrial experience. Adding to his working knowledge of industrial problems, Powderly had skills that set him apart from others. As a young machinist, he had a boundless, almost manic energy and ability to master almost any task and an unending quest to improve himself. As the Grand Master Workman of the Knights of Labor, Powderly displayed the charismatic negotiating skills the Mollies lacked. Using a wide focus, Powderly worked to gather all skilled and unskilled workers into one union to fight for an eight-hour day and the abolition of child labor. Powderly's activism with the Knights of Labor shows the other side of the coin of Irish labor organizations. The son of Irish immigrants born in Carbondale, Powderly worked in the machine shops of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. The same hardships that motivated the Mollies to revenge killings led Powderly to join the Machinists and Blacksmiths Union. When a financial panic triggered a depression in 1873, Powderly lost his job with the DLW and was quickly let go from another job at the Dixon Manufacturing Company. After watching his father-in-law and brother-in-law and other Irish Catholic friends lose their jobs as well, Powderly began to consider the role of, the, uh, role of ethnicity in the hiring and firing process. His experience in the machine shops led him to believe that when the bodies of men are abused, overworked, and starved until a stage of human development is reached where the brute takes the place of the man, spirituality is dwarfed if not killed, and the finest, noblest attributes of the human soul are stifled. His personal experience, combined with his continued unemployment, led Powderly to take on a series of, of leadership roles in the machinists' union. His union connections found him a job with the Allegheny Valley Railway in Oil City, where he continued his union activities. Appointed Western Pennsylvania's chief organizer for the Industrial Congress in the summer of 1874, Powderly was captivated by the Congress's vision of an all-inclusive, multifaceted labor movement. When he was inducted into the Noble and Holy Order of the Knights of Labor on September 6, 1876, Powderly brought with him the Congress's goal of organizing every department of productive industry in an effort to make industrial, moral, and social worth not wealth, the true standard of industrial and national greatness. The Knights of Labor had been founded in Philadelphia by, Uriah, by, Philadelphia, by Philadelphia Taylor, Uriah Stevens in December 1869 as a replacement for his disbanded local craft guilds and view in, grew into a viable replacement for the Industrial Congress. Ironically, after Franklin Galvin had worked so hard to eradicate the WBA and unions in Reading, um, the Knights of Labor was founded in Reading, um, literally under Galvin's nose which is a nice bit of spite for him. Um, the Knights committed to a varied membership that set them apart from traditional trade unions. Only those working in a definite trade could become members of a union of, a union of that trade, while men of all callings, with a few exceptions, could join the mixed assembly in the Knights of Labor. Um, not, a, not a traditional union, the Knights relied on a combination of secrecy, fraternalism, ritualism, and the rhetoric of Christian brotherhood to entice members. Borrowed from the Freemasons, the order's ritual fraternalism created powerful bonds between members, building, essentially building a psychic community among members. The order also used evangelical rhetoric in their fight against the wage system. The Knights of Labor sought to create labor reforms through social reforms with political and cultural activism. Political, political activity became one of the most not notable of the Knights' activities, and one that propelled pow Powderly into three terms as the mayor of Scranton. Powderly was known and respected in every coal mine and machine shop from Carbondale to Wilkes-Barre, and his political impetus came from one of the symbols of wealth the Knights fought so hard to eradicate, W.W. W. Scranton, the owner of the Lachlan Iron and Coal Company, and one of the wealthiest men and largest employers in Scranton. The railroad strike swept across the country in July and August of 1877, virtually shut down every industry in Scranton. What had been a peaceful meeting on August 1st quickly turned into a rioting mob that destroyed the city's iron foundries and the shops of the DLNW. As the mob moved into the city's business district, W.W. Scranton met the striking men with an armed posse, the Scranton City Guard. The City Guard fired into the crowd, leaving three Irish miners dead and 25 others wounded. 
Powderly blamed the bloodshed on Mayor McCune, who had deputized the city guard, and W.W. Scranton, who had given a shoot-to-kill order in the guard before they moved against the mob. Powderly, hoping for a way to, quote, put an end to King Scranton, began organizing workers' assemblies to defeat employers and their political henchmen during the next election. Powderly was nominated as the Greenback Labor Party candidate and wrote of the nominating convention, quote, I am very sorry I cannot give you an idea of my popularity by telling you how long the applause continued. When it ended, I faced the convention as promptly accepted the nomination as if I had been hankering for it the whole time. I'd show that fellow whether I'd make a hell of a mayor or not. He promised to reduce municipal debt, make the mayor's office more efficient, and create a professional, efficient police force to protect the city to eliminate the need for the extra-legal Scranton City Guard. Powderly's campaign, seen as a challenge to the status quo, was a success, and he was elected mayor of Scranton on February, February 1878 at the age of 29. Powderly, in his clash with Scranton, chose the ballot over the bullet, further separating his actions from those of the Molly Maguires. Also, in interestingly, um, it's W.W. Scranton's brother, uh, Joseph August Augustine Scranton, who published one of the largest daily newspapers in Scranton, Scranton Republican, um, because Powderly was basically campaigning against his brother. He never, ever appears in the paper. Uh, even when he becomes mayor, the Scranton Republican just kind of ignores his entire campaign in terms of office, um, which is impressive in its small mindedness. But yeah, it, it, it never, ever appears. Um, but moving on, uh, the chief difference between Powderly and the Molly Maguires was their reliance on violence as a means to an end. The Mollies attempted to use violence to convince others to see their point, while Powderly believed that when violence is once invoked in a labor trouble, the odds from that time against this are, are against the success of the strikers. In his view, violence reduced the effectiveness of labor organizations. Powderly's view was carried by Franklin Gowan, who attached the Mollies to the WBA and looked less favorably upon the union as a terrorist organization. Powderly can work to maintain cordial relations and keep all negotiations as open as possible. In a letter to Jay Gould during the Missouri Pacific strike, Powderly offered to allow an arbitration committee to review not only the Knights' proposal, but also to critique their actions and methods. Unlike the Mollies, Powderly advocated for open relations with the powers that be rather than violent attacks. He believed that a system of cooperation which would make every man his own master. Um, in Powderly's view, executing the mine owner did not remove the problem, it, only, it simply increased it. There was no one left to negotiate with. Uh, the Knights' membership continued to increase in the 1880s, while the Union advocated for an eight-hour workday. Powderly hoped to achieve the stated goal of the Knights through a calculated action based on long-term education about the moral desirability of a shortened workday. The Proceedings of the American Federation of Labor Convention in May of 1886 stated, Never before in the history of the country was there such a general upheaval noticed among the industrial masses as has, as has been witnessed during the past year. The desire for fewer hours led thousands to affiliate with existing organizations, besides being a means of organizing large numbers previously indifferent to the agitation of the labor question. Although both organizations advocated for the eight-hour day, Powderly clashed with the leaders of the AFL when they called for a general strike in support, in support of it in 1885. Uh, seldom moved by anger, Powderly opposed strikes in favor of conciliatory measures in solving labor disputes. Powderly's dislike of strikes stemmed from his early career as a machinist. Machinists, he said, were expected to live up to a strict ethical code that included a manly bearing toward their employers and that they rarely went on strike at all. He believed strikes caused unnecessary antagonism between employees and employers and avoided them if possible. Powderly did, however, worked to create support networks of money and food for those who did go on strike so their families would not starve. The Knights of Labor were also one of the first labor organizations to allow women into their ranks. After 1880, the order admitted women members and began to advocate for equal rights for men and women. While defending an enlargement of women's public roles, Powderly addressed critics who wanted to apply outdated middle-class middle class roles to the lives of working-class women. The capitalist contends that it is wrong to bring innocent, pure, delicate women among wicked, sinful, rough men in assemblies of the Knights of Labor because it would degrade her virtue. But capitalists do not say that it is wrong for her to stand 10 and 15 hours a day among wicked, sin, rough, wicked, wicked sinful, rough men in factories to be sworn at by a brutal overseer. If the assembly is not a fit place for women, it is not a fit place for men either. 
not all members were as open as Powderly, and the main lodges openly blackballed women. Uh, the inclusion of women was one of the early signs of decline in the Knights' membership rules. Two other almost simultaneous events helped contribute to the end of the Knights of Labor. The national repression and retrenchment of labor unions in response to the violence of the Haymarket bombing and the failed Great Southwestern Railroad strike of 1886. Powderly was replaced as Grand Master Workman in 1893, and the Knights continued to decline. The Socialist Labor Party split from the Knights to form the rival Socialist Trade and Labor Alliance, and the 1905 rise of industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies, uh, drew further, drew further drew members from the Knights. The organization maintained a central office until 1917 and held conventions until 1923, but their effectiveness as a labor organization had ended. Uh, to conclude, the Molly Maguires and Terence Powderly, through the Knights of Labor, uh, both tried to solve the problems of labor and capital. The Mollies threatened and killed those who fought against them, while Powderly built a career through politics and negotiation. He claimed, I was never a reformer and always objected to being called one. If I had the right to give myself a name, I would call it Equalizer. Powderly avoided any action that would cause strife between employers and employees. The Mollies avoided strife by simply executing any men they believed caused it. Um, Powderly avoided any action. Oh, sorry. Uh, both groups relied on personal creeds and solved problems in the best way that they knew. In the end, the forces of capitalism triumphed over both. Franklin Gowan and the Reading Railroad maintained control over the southern coal fields, occupied the bottom rung of society. Only with the later influx of southern and eastern European immigrants were the Irish able to move up through the ranks. Powderly's Knights of Labor reached an apex and then declined and saw their goal of integrated multidisciplinary union fulfilled by Samuel Gomper's American Federation of Labor. The eight-hour workday was finally established after the 1902 anthracite strike, thanks to the work of John Mitchell and United Mine Workers. Uh, the goals of each group worked, the goals that each group had worked so hard to work so hard for came to fruition a generation later. Powderly's methods of negotiation, rather than the Molly's violence, became the accepted method, method for conducting business, but each undeniably left their mark on history. Oh, look at that. That was quick. Um, <laughs> I can I can open the floor um, to questions briefly. Um, if anyone has has any has any questions, uh, please chime in. Any other questions for Sarah or comments? Yes, I'm am, saying am it's I, a very nice program. Oh, it really was. Yeah. yeah. Um, have the Molly Maguire's been pardoned? I seem to remember way back in my younger days that I believe it was Governor Shap. Uh, they took a look at the trial and realized how uh, it was all rigged against the Mollies and they, they pardoned them, I believe, didn't they? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about all of them across the board, um, but Black Jack Kehoe is generally regarded to be the, the leader. And I know he was he was pardoned by the governor in like 1979, I think. Um, it was almost 100 years later, um, but they, they were they were eventually pardoned, pardoned by the state. Sarah, uh, Bob Walensky would like you to comment on Powderly's role on the Dillingham Commission, where he seemed to disparage many of the new immigrants, including reducing their numbers. Oh, God. Bob? Yeah, you had to throw that one in there. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, by the way, Governor oh. Shap, Governor Shap pardoned Kehoe in 1978 or 9. Sarah's correct. And uh, that seemed, by extension, to pardon all of the Mollies, but only Kehoe was actually pardoned. Um, I, I know his name was associated. I wasn't sure about the rest of them. Yeah. Um, yeah but, you know, was, at least he, one of them got something. Yeah. Um, but um, later yeah, on, I, I, really, I really can't speak to, to Powderly's later later roles. I, I looked at what he was doing in, in Scranton at the time, um, but I, I know he, he did continue to be, to be active, um, kind of more behind the scenes. Um, but beyond that, I, I wasn't really focusing that much that much on there. Um, if you have thoughts on it, you know, please share. No, no, I, I understand. I, that's it wasn't the subject of your of your talk. I thought maybe you came across it in your travels. But um, he was the I think he was the chairman of the Dillingham Commission, or he was he was one of the authorities on it. This was a study in the early uh, 1900s, a commission by the U.S. Congress to study all these immigrants that were coming in because there was a belief in the country that these Eastern and Southern Europeans mainly were degrading the uh, moral and genetic stock of the country. Those were the words that were used, the Eastern and Southern Europeans. And um, we did, as it turns out, because of the Dillingham Commission, big long report 
In fact, one of the sections deals with with the anthracite. Um, uh, they we ended up passing three laws in the twenties to exclude Eastern and Southern Europeans from these shores. And we didn't lift those laws until after World War II. Okay, so if you're a descendant of Poles or Russians or Ukrainians or Slovenians or Italians, I'm very sure that your relatives came before, say, 1925 or 26, uh, because we shut the door and we increased immigration from Northern Europe. And, um, and, we, and we also decreased immigration from China, because these, these people were and, and, and Powderly spoke in favor of this. And this was the era of eugenics when we were very, very interested in the, you know, the, the, the genetic stock of the country. And if all these Italians and Poles keep and Chinese keep breeding, well, they're going to replace the whites. They're going to replace the whites because Italians and Poles and Chinese were not considered white. Irish were not considered white. Well, by the, by the 1900s, the Irish became white. There's volumes on this. You've heard me speak about it, some of you. Anyway, I was. it's interesting that Powderly, who was Irish and who suffered those barbs early on, now seems to be part of that movement to keep this, this degenerate, <laughs> these degenerate peoples out. And, and I, I didn't know of whether you came anything across that in your travels. I didn't. I, I had I had the sense earlier um, when Powderly was starting with with the Knights of Labor, he he took the approach that Johnny Mitchell would use later about um, his his line that we're all the same color when we come out of the mines. Um, we needed to find a, a way to bring everyone together under the same under the same union rather than relying on specific things for specific jobs. Um, he was looking for a way to bring people together at least to get started, um, and then you know maybe when his union was successful later considered hmm. There are too many people in my union. How do I get rid of some of them? Yeah. Um, but to get to start out initially, um, he, I think he, he did kind of, I said, take that, that same approach that the Johnny Mitchell would, would later take um, to write the ways to bring people together rather than exclude them, um, at least when he was when he was getting started. So, Sarah, Christine I, Blake, I see your, your hand oh, up. Sorry. Me, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, it was a very good presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I have kind of a comment slash question, I guess. Um, I have ancestors who worked in the mines, like grandparents and great, and ancestors of friends whose par uh, great parent grandparents worked in the mines. And I always remember hearing stories of, I'm going to call it a cultural war, because I'm an Italian descent. And of course, that's what they were referring to, um, how the Irish and the Italians clashed a lot and constantly. Yet I never read or hear anything about that in any presentations. Other than this today, I learned a little bit more about the Molly Maguires, but does it stem from their feeling of superiority or have you ever come across anything like that? It may. Um, I mean, we, we it tends to, the, the, the strikes in Scranton at least, they, they first, they start out with the Irish and the Welsh um, that had a, a long-standing antagonism um, that sort of that sort of carried over. Um, it has to do had to do with um, the roles with, within the mines and their position position within the mines, um, their ability to move up move up through the ranks. Um, as the Italians came over later, the Italians sort of filled in that that bottom rung in the mines the Irish had previously occupied under Welsh miners. Um, so as somebody else was coming in to be the bottom, the Irish kind of were able to, to boost up or to pull themselves up, um, up a, a little a little farther. So any you know new coming or new new antagonisms that started were again, why do you have a better job than I do? Why can't I move up in, into that into that position? Um, as again as as Bob has pointed out many times, um, the, the Italians in the mines had their own way of dealing with things, also usually with grenades through windows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, a, a lot of that, again, kind of just stems from from their roles with, with within the mining community. Um, you know how how you're able to access different roles, different wage, different wage structures. Um, it was based based on experience largely um, as as they were coming in. Um, you said that the Welsh had started out with mining experience. They were the foremen. The Irish worked under them. Um, as new groups came in to do the hard, do the heavy lifting, um, the Irish moved up into higher positions and then again clashed with those mm -hmm. underneath them rather than those above them, since they were kind of more the, the top of the top mm -hmm. of the rung. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. It's interesting how the uh, unions adopted seniority for for jobs, yet the seniority idea of we were here first of all these ethnic groups, you know, predate, predated that. 
And I had read somewhere recently about after World War II, when the veterans from the coal region came back to, the, to uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania, um, they wanted the jobs that the people from other areas had filled in while they were overseas soldiers and there was all that going on. So all of us tend to say, I was here first, I was first in line, I should have some sort of priority. And these new people, whether they're different or they're willing to work for less or whatever, um, shouldn't take my opportunity. And so that friction seems to be whether pre-union, ethnic union, or just the way people tend to be. I mean, we all tend to be that way. Um, we don't want our jobs taken away by a newcomer. Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's 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 definitely a, a fair, fair assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Needed, the unions needed some kind of structure to maintain themselves. Um, but yeah, there, there was always some fighting of I need to be better than somebody else, at least. Um, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who, but you need, need to have some seniority over somebody to maintain some control yourself. All right. Again, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, we do have another, another program tomorrow. It will be available on our YouTube stream as well. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be, we'll, France State Heritage Month, we'll be looking at the histories of four anthracite coal companies um, and their, their, their impact on the, on the industry. That program will be available in person at 3 p.m. at the Albright Library. And also, also as I said, recorded, li recorded and live streamed on our YouTube channel as well. Our next Lackawanna Pastimes episode, February 24th, I will be joined then by our friends from the University of Scranton, who will be talking more about their Scranton Story, Our Nation's Story project. They've, they've been ongoing for a number of years, two years now, um, looking at different ways of, the ways how the Scranton Story fits into a national story. It's an oral history project. Uh, they'll be talking about some of the stories they've already captured and some other upcoming events that they have going on. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Have a good weekend. <music>